Moving forward to set up the train car and get it ready to use, I figured the easiest way to go was just a basic setup and work from there. It's something I've learned from working in web and software development. You just create a minimum viable product. I need to begin using it and learn what I need to improve. As of right now, I have several things I've been selling online, and I need a place to store those items, interview people, produce shows, and create things. And Mary Joy has been working as an artist admin for local artists and creators, helping them figure out their books and taxes and set up a process to manage their money. Those are all things that are actually happening right now. What we want to do is add a multimedia recording and streaming studio to produce a network of shows and a retail space to sell collectibles and source local artwork, clothing, music, and comics. But we aren't doing that yet, so we can always build up to that. And right now, it's just a concept that we're working up to. It doesn't need to slow down the momentum of what is working. We can always build up to that later. So what we needed right now was just to make the place presentable. New floors, because the carpet was all gross in the car and it was nasty. Add a bathroom and patch up some of the damage from over the years. And we were figuring out what paint we wanted to use and buying the floorboards. And in a week or so, I'd be working with an intern to help catalog the collectible items that I've been selling. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. So after picking out some of the paint, I went back to the house and did an interview that I had scheduled today. My name is Margaret Dent. I paint animal portraits, pet portraits. I also am a jewelry designer. She had responded to my call out to artists that I sent to the American Bandito mailing list. And she's the second person that I've spoken to from Canada. So we did our discussion online over Facebook Messenger. You are the second person I've talked to from Canada now. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. So whereabouts what? in Canada are you? I am in Hamilton area in southern Ontario. Okay. Have you always been in Canada? No, I haven't. Actually, I was born in Poland. Um, really? Yes. Uh, and I came to Canada when I was 17 years old and have been here ever since. Just family moved over here, or how come you came? Well, when I was 16 years old was when the whole thing with solidarity and everything happened in Poland and, you know, all the unrest, and, and my mother was very uncomfortable with that and thought that there, there was a possibility of war or civil unrest, so she decided to, to leave Poland and emigrate. And it was, it was a pretty scary time. Wow. Okay. And how, so how do you enjoy Canada? Ah, to be honest, when I came to Canada, it felt like I came home. Really? Um, yes, I. I am a very bad Polish person. <laughs> I have. I for some reason, I honestly never felt at home in Poland. It's the weirdest feeling. Huh. And when I came to Canada, I was like, "Oh my God, this is this is my home." So, how long have you been making the stuff that you do? Well, with art, I am told that I started drawing when I was a little kid, basically, you know, drawing on any piece of paper I could find. So that basically has been, you know, most of my life. With jewelry, I've always had kind of a liking to shiny things. In fact, my, my grandmother used to call me her little magpie because I would find, you know, pretty pieces of glass on the ground or or glass glass gems, you know, fake gems, and I and I would collect them like a magpie when I was okay. a kid. And then my one of my uncles uh, actually was a geologist, and he had a few uh, really pretty stones that he gave me, so I kind of added them to my collection. So that 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 part has always been somehow there, but I never really thought that you could make your own jewelry. And then. I guess I just found some some groups on on the internet, and I realized, oh my God, people are actually doing their own stuff and their own jewelry, and and they learn on their own. And then of course I discovered the YouTube videos and and started teaching myself. So I have been doing that since my son was born. So since 2000, started learning how to actually polish my own stones, things like you know amethyst and making cabs, basically cabochons. What was the one thing that made you go? I think I should try making jewelry. I, I kind of fell in love with opals. Opals have always been, you know, my, my favorite stone that I absolutely loved. Knowing how, how expensive real opals from Australia were, I was thinking, you know, I'll probably never actually own a real stone, like real opal jewelry. And if I do, it's going to cost a lot or it's going to be really, really tiny. And then I found... I think it was actually on eBay. I found people selling uh, Ethiopian wello opals, 
which are actually quite beautiful opals, but they're a lot cheaper than the Australian ones. And then I found a couple of videos on how to polish them actually without even any equipment, uh, like an actual lapidary equipment. Uh, you can do it with just waterproof uh, sandpaper. Okay. So I gave it a try. I mean, it was a very crude stone. I still have it. It was really a very, very crude stone. It was just a couple of sides polished. And it kind of blew my mind because I was like, oh, my God, I can actually buy my own opals and I can polish them. I'm going to do something with them. That's basically where that started. So I bought a little lap, uh, lap polishing machine and started learning on uh, online how to set them. And, and, and that's kind of how that involved, uh, evolved. It just basically came from the love for opals, you know, that kind of spread out to other stones as well. And just love creating. I think that that's what the whole thing boils down to is no matter what it is, I love creating, doing things, making things. When did you yeah. start making them to the point where you're like, I'm going to try and sell these? I think it gets to the point when you have so many of these things at home, then you're like, well, I, there's really no point keeping them all. You can't at justify home. having that many of them is what you're saying. Exactly. Yes. And of course, there's also the way that you have to find a way to pay for all the stuff that you buy. So, you know, I thought, I think I'm going to have to start selling them to, to basically support my hobby. Up till now, it really has been a hobby because I, I work full time in a field not related to art at all. So I only have, you know, limited of time to be doing it. But it's always been in the back of my head somewhere that at some point I would really like to either retire early or, you know, quit my job if I can and, and actually do art all the time. I agree with what she says about selling to justify what most people would consider a hobby. That's why one of the things I've been doing is selling collectibles and action figures because I love finding that stuff. And I needed more than one thing to bring an in income that wasn't client based that I would like to keep doing. And I like pop culture crap. And one thing that I can do is sell it online or locally anytime. I asked Margaret about where she first started selling her work. How were you reaching out to people or were you going to shows or did you just go straight to selling them online? I think I started mostly on Etsy. Okay. That was that was my number one platform. Uh, and this was when Etsy was still actually pretty small. So it wasn't global, but it was definitely Canadian and U.S. market. I have also done some shows, local shows. I'm not doing them as much right now because shows really are very, very hard uh, physically, you know, hauling and yeah. Um, and when you're working full time, plus I've, I, you know, up till now my kids were were younger, so you you don't always have time. And and many shows are not just you know one day show; they're often two or three day shows. You know, if if I wanted to go to bigger shows, I would have to go to places like Toronto and an area, and that's driving time again. And and they're usually bigger shows, or the entry fees are so big that it's just not worth it for a small, you know, small business. So you've been selling an Etsy for quite some time. I mean, how well has that done for you over the years? Etsy is kind of a love hate relationship, really. Etsy wasn't too bad in the beginning when it was a small, um, small platform uh, before they went public, but it's never made me a lot of money. But I also have to be fair in saying that to sell on Etsy or any online platform, you have to put a lot of time into it. It's not like a store, you know, in a mall. You can't just put your stuff and wait for it to sell. You have to promote it yourself. You have to have a big store, first of all. You have to have a big shop. You have to have a lot of items in it. And you have to keep adding things or changing things all the time to be to be basically noticed. And yours are all unique items. They're not like, oh, here's 10 pairs of this particular earring. It's here's a pair of earrings and here's exactly. another one. And, yeah. and they take time to make. So if you're not doing it full time, it's really hard to put in that time. So my store hasn't been doing very well. And again, I can't I can't blame it all on the fact that Etsy's gone public and it's a huge company now. But but it is also the fact that I'm not putting a lot of time into it. What do you think of the new changes that are happening at Etsy? Just out of curiosity. Personally, I really don't like what they've done. You know, looking through the forums of all the sellers, the prevailing feeling is that Etsy has basically changed from a company that was working for the seller to the company that is just interested in making money. I think that was actually quite quite obvious when that happened. You, you could see the change. They're pushing really, really hard right now for the, for the sellers to offer free shipping, which of course, you know, it sounds wonderful in theory, right? I mean, a buyer definitely will be more likely to buy something if the shipping is free. But the fact is that to offer that, you either have to swallow that payment because you still have to ship it. You still have to pay for it. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. Canada Post or, or U.S. Postal Service do not offer free shipping. 
So either the buyer has to swallow that cost or the seller does. Yeah. Um, and they have been pushing that very, very hard. And there are a lot of sellers who are unhappy with that because, again, usually it's the, it's the seller that swallows the cost. I think it's unfair in a way that many sellers sell things that are easy to ship. So mm. for me, uh, let's say shipping uh, a pendant, it costs about nine ten dollars just straight shipping without without signature or, or, or insurance or anything like that so when you add shipping has been going steadily up both in canada and u.s and that's one of the reasons why people are complaining about it and it just occurred to me too you being one of the first people i've spoken to in canada that does this if i were to buy something from you that would also mean that it's from one country to another so that would be yeah. even more right Exactly. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah. That didn't even occur to me because I just always think of it like, oh, I'm shipping it across the U.S. But no, I'm you and you and I are in different countries right now. <laughs> and, and I actually sell quite a bit of my my uh, stuff to U.S. And and I've had some sales to to Europe as well. For a pair of earrings, what you could probably shipping could cost up to like eleven, twelve dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, huh. definitely. For the most part, up till now, I've only been doing print on demand products and all of the shipping and things like that were done for me. So that's why I started selling unique items when I started testing out different platforms and carts. So I could get a better feel for what it was like to build a catalog where nothing was the same. Experiment with shipping different items so that I could learn from doing it. One thing I found was a great little site called Pirate Ship. It'll let you enter your package details and it will search for the best shipping methods and you can print that label directly from that site at a discount. I don't know how they do it, but it's actually pretty cool. The website is pirateship.com, which I don't know how they got that website either. And another thing that just about any seller that I have talked to and, and have seen uh, talking on the on the forums are very unhappy is that they do actually allow resellers on, on the website right now. Etsy started as a handmade market. Right. And that was their, basically their tagline. That was their, um, their thing. And then of course, all the, all these huge sellers from China came on and, you know, selling duplicates and duplicates and duplicates of the same necklace that obviously is made in a factory somewhere. Yeah. Um, and they were very, very, and still are very slow in removing them and people will be complaining. So when you do a search or somebody's doing a search for a kind of necklace, instead of getting the real handmade, you know, individual stuff, they will get 10 listings of something that looks exactly the same or very similar. And, you know, and it costs $5 because it's been made in, in, in a factory in China. And those are the ones that will pay for the sponsorship that gets to the top of the search. Exactly, exactly. Because yeah. they have, you know, because they have stores of 2,000, 10,000 items uh, because it's all the same stuff. And, and so people have been very unhappy about that. Uh, and that's been, you know, for many years now. And that's been a big problem. You bring up a good point. I mean, that's what they had is that they were a market where you went and searched there because you were going to buy handmade stuff. And now with yeah. the new changes yeah. they're making, they're just basically becoming an eBay. Uh, for the exactly. most part. But there's also, and I'm very curious about this one, Amazon mm -hmm. opened their own handmade section of yeah. their platform. So, I mean, at this point, it's like, well, everybody's evil now. So why not go for the one that everybody's <laughs> familiar with? Go to Amazon. <laughs> the lesser evil, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So people might yeah. be more likely to find it on Amazon now. You said you wanted to try and build this up as you as you went on with life. <laughs> That's a weird way to put that. <laughs> But as you did, what would you say you would change if you decided to really amp it up and like kind of go that direction? I would probably put a lot more time in my own store. As, so my own, basically my own website on uh, t totally separate from Etsy. Um, and I do have one. But again, because working full time, I don't have a lot of time and I'm pretty busy with in my community as well. So I don't have a lot of time. So my website sits there, but it really doesn't do much work right now for me. But I would definitely probably put a lot more work in my own um, in my own website. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, uh, if if I retired, I would be going to more shows. When you go to shows, do you just bring your jewelry or do you also bring your artwork? That depends on the show. There are some that I've done in the past that were just artwork. There were some that were just jewelry. And there were some that will actually allow me to bring both. It really depends very much on, on the individual show and how they're set up. Margaret had mentioned that she not only makes jewelry, but she sells art as well. And I needed to ask her a particular question about the subject matter because it's actually one that's come up more than once on previous episodes that I've done. I was looking at your artwork and here's the weird thing. I've talked to several people and 
when I asked them what they started drawing and what they started doing, a lot of them would say horses. A lot of the work you've done is horses. So <laughs> is it just you're interested in horses or do you actually like ride horses? Like what's, what's your angle with horses? <laughs> <laughs> what's my deal with horses? Well, yeah. The reason that I started drawing horses was because I have always loved horses. That kind of has always gone hand in hand with my art. I don't remember the time when I didn't love horses. I don't get when, that. So many people tell me this and I'm like, I, know, I don't get it. Know. I grew up in an industrial town in Poland as well. So mm -hmm. there was no, no countryside around uh, that I had easy access to. My mother tells me of a story of going to a farmer's market and, and when I was about 18 months old and finding me under a big draft horse, petting it. <laughs> Yeah, so that started very, very early on. <laughs> okay. And I think because I couldn't be around horses, my next thing was to basically collect any and all info that I could find about horses. So I started collecting books, pictures, and I started drawing them. Just basically wanted to reproduce, you know, the beauty that I saw. And I've done that. Basically, horses were the only thing that I drew literally till about the, the time that my son was born, which was around, again, 2000. What happened was when I was on maternity leave with him, I found this wonderful group, uh, Yahoo discussion group at the time. This was before the, the Facebook time. Yeah, it was. Yahoo discussion groups. Wow. Oh, old school. Yeah. It's actually still there, I think. Okay. Um, it was called Growing Together. And it was basically a group for people that drew in pencil, because that's what I've done up to that time was just pencil, graphite. And I joined this wonderful group, and it was just full of wonderful, supportive artists from around the world. I think it was basically led, maybe even started by a fantastic artist from UK, whose name is, and I can't remember right now, Mike something. He does absolutely fantastic drawings in pencil uh, of dogs and dog scenes. So I joined the group and I was, you know, quite awed by the talent that was in the group. And I always thought that I was just like a little, you know, backcountry drawer that kind of did, you know, okay stuff. And I was actually met with, with wonderful support and, and I was admiring all the wonderful things that people were drawing. And everybody said, well, you know, you can draw th other things too. And I said, no, I can only draw horses. And I think it was actually Mike who came back and he said, Basically, honey, if you can draw horses like that, you can draw anything hmm. because it's basically all it is is just a play of light and dark. It has nothing to do with whether it's a horse or a dog or a person or, or a tree. It's yeah. just a play of dark and light. And, you know, he kind of made me think and I thought, well, actually, he kind of has a point. So I decided to try something else. And the first thing that I tried was actually a portrait of my son and my daughter. And yeah, it was like, oh, my God, he was right. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, but but I mean, that's that's how that happened. So then I, you know, I branched into other things and then tried different media and uh, it just kind of went from there. Wow. But horses, yeah, horses started everything. And, and yes, I do ride. I, well, not presently, but I do know how to ride. While she did have success with the Yahoo group in the past, how is she connecting with like-minded people these days? I think a, a big part of people finding my stuff, it was from Facebook from my posts, my Facebook posts. Okay. Yeah. I haven't been on Instagram for a long time, but I think uh, there's a few from the Instagram as well. And you just link them to your, your Etsy posts from there? You take a picture of it and it's in your profile or? Kind of do a mishmash, actually. I think my Instagram is linked to Facebook. Maybe it's the other way. No, I think it's the Etsy that's linked to Facebook. Yeah, it's, a, it's something that I have to actually, it's on my, my, my list to do. I have to figure that out because I've done some stuff in the past and I'm not sure if it's still linked properly, but there used to be that my Etsy was linked to my Facebook. So if I posted on Etsy, it would automatically post on Facebook. Oh, right. I got you. Okay. And with Instagram, I usually have to do it manually. So I post on Instagram and then post on Facebook. When people do see your stuff, what do you think appeals to them about it? What do you think draws people in if they see your stuff for the first time? Or what have people told you they liked about your stuff? Well, I think for my horses and my, my pet portraits, it's I've been told that I have a knack to really capture the personality of the animal in, in the portrait. I, I think I see me do, myself doing it. I have no idea how I do it, but I but I can see that sometimes. I, I will look at a horse uh, that I've drawn and and I realize that I can see its character. I, I try, if, if possible, I try to actually meet the horse that I draw uh, if if the oh. if the owner goes by. Obviously. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, if they're far away, obviously that that's not possible. But uh, the portrait that I'm drawing right now, I've I've met the horse, and he's he's just such a character. <laughs> 
<laughs> he is fantastic. His name is Finnegan, and he's an off-track uh, thoroughbred uh, racer, a uh, past ra- racehorse. I'm really not sure. I mean, people say they love it. I, I don't always ask them exactly what they love about it. Maybe I should. <laughs> Can't hurt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a good idea. I think many artists are almost in awe when somebody wants to buy their work. Oh, yeah, I can see that. I get yeah, that. Yeah, kind of like, oh, my God, somebody wants to, somebody wants to buy something of mine. I'm, oh, my God, oh, my God. And you kind of freak out. And, and, and then, you, you, you know, you maybe later think, well, maybe I should have asked them why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can visit Margaret's website and check out more of her work at margaretdent.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, head on over to my website, AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe, where you can sign up for the mailing list or find all the links to the other stuff that I'm doing. Go to AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. The music for the show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. Thanks for listening. And until the next episode, so long. Mm-hmm.